Welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. We're your hosts, Sue and Alex Bush, and our goal with this podcast is to be the number one resource on your fitness journey. And today we're going to be talking about something that I think a lot of people want along their fitness journey. Absolutely. And what is that thing? (laughs) People really want to grow their glutes. You know, I, for one, definitely fit into that group. So today's topic is going to be a glute q and I've gathered some questions from you all and just put together a lot that I think that will be really helpful for people to hear on their glute growth journey. Awesome. Let's start off with why glute strength is even important to have. Glute strength is important because it's going to be something that many people lack to begin with because we're sitting on our bum a majority of the day and it's not a a muscle group that's just going to vicariously eh, I say this and and now as I'm starting to think it through I may take it back but you're not going to vicariously just get a lot of glute training in your resistance training um, and so having a little bit more specific glute training is going to be helpful for so many things just through day-to-day life uh, from a pelvic positioning standpoint so many people struggle with lower back pain and a lot of it is originated with having weak glutes and and being in this anterior pelvic tilt position and things of that nature. And so if we're able to get people into a stronger position with their glutes and with their quads and all the things surrounding the pelvis, we can alleviate a lot of these day-to-day pains that a lot of people experience. And as you age and you lose muscle, it's something that having glute tissue can be so helpful. I remember that I was training my dad a few years ago in person, and he was he made a comment of, I'm not trying to get these huge glutes. And I was like, you still need to do movements that are going to train your glute because you need to have the best pelvic health as you age. And so being able to really look at it of, of course, it's great to see your actual glute size increase, but there's other benefits from doing it as well, from just feeling better on a day-to-day basis. Correct. All right. This next one is really good. Are you ready? Can everyone grow their glutes or is glute growth genetic? Everyone has an opportunity to grow their glutes. Now, can some people have some genetic factors within the their limb lengths and the length of their torso and those different factors that gives them a greater opportunity to bias their glutes in different exercises? Probably. There's going to be a genetic factor to those limb links. Are there going to be individuals who are very fortunate and have a very well-biased fat distribution to their glutes relative to other areas of their body? And it appears as though (laughs) that they have these juicy glutes that don't actually exist if they were to lose the body fat. Yes, there's going to be a genetic component to that. But those two things are the only factors that are going to um, be genetic. And then everything else is just going to be around setting yourself up within the exercises and the consistency of performing the exercises uh, that will allow for you or anyone who wants to grow their glutes to grow them. I think that sometimes when people hear that something is genetic, they immediately think, oh, then I just can't do it because I don't have that genetic predisposition for whatever it is. And I feel like I am very much so living proof of you cannot have the genetics for it and even have things that are quote unquote working against you of I have very long femurs and my glutes have very low insertion points. So for me to really have this full glute that I want, it's a lot more tissue than possibly someone else. But I have been able with, of course, your help, I've been able to grow my glutes and continue to grow my glutes way past anything I ever thought possible. And it makes me so excited because I know it's still going to take time to see it to exactly where I want to. I'm super duper pleased with where we're at so far, but it just makes me excited because I'm going to keep training and keep getting after it. And then I'll just get to a place where I have the hugest glutes and it's going to be awesome. It is. I mean, it's fantastic because (laughs) I help myself out in this whole situation as well. So it's a win-win win for me. (laughs) Michael Scott. (laughs) Exactly. So if everyone has the availability to grow their glutes, then why aren't my glutes growing? (laughs) There are a number of reasons why someone's glutes wouldn't be growing. I I think that um, oftentimes with any situation, we want to be able to attribute 
the answer to our problems to one thing. And in this scenario, it's not going to be one thing. It's going to be a cumulative effect from multiple things. And so it could be a factor of the wrong exercises being performed. I think this is the first one that many people run to immediately of like, I'm just doing the wrong exercises. I need to do better exercises. And that may be true, but you honestly may be doing the right exercises, just not doing those exercises well. And that leads me into kind of the second thing is the exercise execution being very important, but also the intensity in which you're performing those exercises. Because I would also say that a majority of individuals are not training hard enough to actually elicit a response of change and growth that they're wanting to have. They may feel as though that they are, but in all actuality, they haven't really pushed near failure or even to failure within their training ever. And so it really puts them in a position where they're not going to see the growth that they desire. The other factor would be uh, nutrition, right? Because if they're not eating enough nutrients to have the optimal recovery, to see the progressive overload that they need in the gym, they're going to be behind the eight ball and lackluster results because they're either always dieting or they're under consuming calories unbeknownst to them because they're not uh, tracking their nutrition or, or things of that nature. When it comes down, I know you said that they're all play a role, so there's not necessarily one that's the most important. So let's go back to the first one of that exercise selection. How is someone supposed to know if they are doing the quote unquote right exercises or wrong exercises? Or even if someone is like extremely quad dominant, do they have to do different exercises than someone else? So how you're going to know if you're doing the exercises correctly, I think there are a lot of great resources on YouTube. Um, our channel is one of those. So physique development on YouTube, we have hundreds of exercise execution videos of me and you going through every exercise in detail and explaining it um, very in my opinion, very well, <laughs> and giving context as to why these different factors are going to be important for the different movements. And so using that as a resource, filming yourself, I think is going to be also very helpful because you may be thinking that you're doing an exercise a particular way and you're not actually doing that. And so using those resources, what was the second question? Was going to be if someone is super quad dominant, do they have to do different exercises than someone else to grow oh, their glutes? I thought there was one in between there. But with the the quad exercises or someone feeling as though that they're quad dominant, the likelihood that they're quad dominant is possible, but I think it's less often than what people actually are because that can be an area in which someone carries more body fat. And so when they look at their physique and they see the side profile and they see more density to the anterior portion of their leg or where that quad would be, they feel as though that they're carrying more quad tissue than they are to their hamstrings and glutes. Um, which is not the case. And once they lose body fat, they realize, oh, I wasn't actually quad dominant. I was just carrying more body fat there. So that could be that person's scenario. But if they are actually someone who just biases more quad and, and more knee flexion in the exercises that they're training their lower body or trying to train their glutes more specifically, then they've got to get into the nuance of really setting themselves up within exercises that are going to better bias their hip flexion and extension relative to knee flexion and an extension. Extension. And so it's going to be exercise selection, but also how they're performing those exercises that are going to set them up better if they are truly quad dominant. So if someone is just wanting to grow their glutes for exercise selection, if they just go to our YouTube and do every glute movement possible, then that's going to be the right exercises for them. Every glute movement possible on there. I think there's like as someone, it's funny that you say that because someone shared with me in uh, my DMs, they were talking about how they were having pain um, with exercises. And I sent them the glute training playlist, all of our exercises for glutes. And she followed it to a T and she was experiencing zero pain. Hadn't had me look over the exercises. She literally just watched the videos and was able to make some changes to those particular exercises, feel a lot more tension in her glutes, but also alleviate some of the lower back and uh, pain that she was experiencing, just the overall stiffness that she would have um, following the training sessions. And so the videos will be a tremendous help, but you do not need to do all 35, mm -hmm. I think that's what it is, mm -hmm. all 35 exercises um, in order to grow your glutes. And when it comes to the quantity of exercises that need to be performed, I don't think that there's a hard number on that. I think that it is more about 
getting great at a handful of exercises. And if I was to just trim it down to three exercises that you could do, if you were to do a dumbbell RDL, a bent knee RDL, able to do a split squat, and then able to do a a hip thrust or a glute bridge of sorts. If you were able to do all three of those and be great at them, and then progressively overload and challenge yourself in different rep ranges and get close to training failure throughout your uh, working sets, you would see a lot of progress just from those three exercises. Now, is it going to get extremely redundant and boring after you know a year plus of just doing those three exercises, rinse and repeat, and changing the exercise uh, or the the repetitions and those different factors? Probably, but you're going to see great results. And so, there's a an aspect of program design that's important to follow when you're structuring you know a year, two years worth of programming um, that you've got to be to keep people engaged in those different factors. But if you really wanted to just get down to the nuts and bolts, you could probably do those three exercises and get great at them and see a lot of progress. I love that you bring up your programming because I think that's a perfect time to let people know that if they are unsure of what exercises to choose or how to execute them, we have something for them. We do. I've been working very hard over the last year on a a training program that ended up being a 16-week glute growth program um, that I feel very, very confident in. And after much discussion, we decided to make the first four weeks of that 16-week program completely free and uh, hundreds nearing thousand, (laughs) nearing a thousand of you have already jumped into that program. And we just released it, uh, three days ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm so excited for everyone to hop in because it's been something that, um, I've wanted to release for a very long time. Something I'm very passionate about is program design, something I've spent a lot of time, uh, money, uh, education is centered around glute training. And I feel within my experience over the last eight years of, of working with so many women to grow their glutes, I feel very confident in this program to be able to help every single person that touches it, um, because of the structure and how I went about the, the volume allocations and the exercise selection and all those different things and, and the teaching within the, the exercises themselves of how we work through it with everyone. Um, I have so much confidence and it's just a, a matter of time before the, uh, the other 12 weeks of this program gets released. And just the first few days of people working through the, the free portion has been so amazing. And it's been great to get feedback and people having so much fun and, um, finally feeling their glutes for the first time from a a programming standpoint and the exercise selection being uh, what it is. And uh, it's it's crazy because I was nervous with the first four week program because it's really just introducing exercise, uh, the movements that are going to be utilized through the programming and really getting to be great at these different movements so that we can really push the pedal to the metal over the next 12 weeks that follow. And so I was a little nervous with people getting into it of like, if they don't, if they don't challenge themselves through this, they're going to feel like they're not getting a ton out of it because on paper, it looks very, very straightforward, but in practice, it's really challenging and can be very challenging. Um, and so I've been very pleased that the feedback's been what the feedback's been. Cause, um, I was a little nervous with that aspect of like, if, if you can crush these four weeks, what you're going to be able to do in the following 12 weeks is, is going to be absolutely insane. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a awesome project and something that I'm so excited to hang my hat on, uh, because I haven't had a product like this before where I've been, uh, one-on-one coaching for as long as I have been. And it's been kind of this like safety net for me of, I can make it as customized as humanly possible to that person to where I know they're going to get the best results. And that gives me peace of mind. And so I've always been hesitant to release a product like this because I don't have full control over it. You know, once it's in the person's hands, they are the ones doing it and I can't make changes, you know, on the dime Mm -hmm. for them. And I finally have kind of let that go and trusted in everyone to (laughs) do what it says basically. And the first, you know, few days here have been so nice because the feedback's been so great. Yeah. And I mean, I'm just, I'm such a believer. I know people are going to say that I'm biased, but no one in the whole entire world has ever called my results fake until now. And let me tell you, that just makes me feel good. People (laughs) think I'm lying because the results are so good. And I am shook 
because no one once has said my glutes have looked fake before. So this is something where, of course, I love and support my husband, but <laughs> results speak for them for themselves. <laughs> With that, is it possible to grow your glutes without growing your legs? Is it possible to grow your glutes without growing your legs? Yes. There are a handful of exercises that are going to be biased 90% towards the glutes and then the other 10% being dispersed to stabilizing tissue around the glutes. Um, is your programming going to be fun? Probably not. It's going to be very redundant. You only have a handful of exercises and you're going to have to be very particular with how you're performing those exercises. But if you are thrilled with your hamstring growth and your uh, quad growth, your adductors, you're, you're happy with those things and you just want to see your glutes grow, you can do that, but you have to be very into the nuance, if you will. It's not going to be like, I'm going to continue to do the same exercises, but I'm going to think I'm just going to grow mm -hmm. my glutes and not my hamstrings and quads. And I've done this with a client of mine and her name is Sable. We've talked about Sable, Hi, Sable. <laughs> a number of times on the podcast. I hope she's listening to this episode. <laughs> newly um, married too. Newly married <laughs> and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and in her journey to becoming an IFBB pro, one of the things that we had to do an immaculate job on was not growing her quads, not growing her adductors, not growing her hamstrings, and just add glute tissue. Her program was boring. <laughs> and th thank goodness she is who she is and was willing to go through the very boring program design and the redundancy to that program design because we were able to accomplish the goal and she was able to uh, win the overall at Junior Nats and become an IFBB pro and then go on to the, the pro stage and compete extremely well. Um, but it can be done and it's really going to be a, a lot of like the exercises that come to my mind right now, you are perform like a 45 degree hip extension, but you're only utilizing a range of motion to that. You're not going through the full range of motion because your um, hamstrings are going to contribute for a portion of that. Your adductors are going to contribute potentially for a portion of that, depending on how much range you're getting to. You think about um, like a, a glute bridge, that hip thrust is not going to, to work here because if we go through a full hip thrust, and when I say hip thrust, I'm thinking all the way to the ground and all the way fully hips extended. That's going to incorporate your, your quads to a degree. Your adductors are gonna play a little bit of a role. Your adductors are, are gonna play a role oftentimes from a stability standpoint. Mm -hmm. But if we're just focusing on glutes, we're gonna focus on like the top 25% of that hip thrust and just focus on a little bit of, of hip flexion and getting all the way back to extension. It's a much smaller range of motion. The other things would be kickback variations. And that's gonna be about it. Like you're pretty slim pickings at that point. You may have some other ways that you can work through some different exercises, but again, it's going to be partial range of motion type things to try and eliminate as much tension as you're able to create with other muscle groups that would be supporting. That was going to be another question if there are any exercises that you could target just your glutes in. So I was glad that you made the comment of like 90% glutes because there are going to be stabilizer muscles and there's not ever going to be just one muscle that works completely alone. If anyone ever tells you they have a, a exercise that trains only glutes or only insert muscle here, then that's just not factual. <laughs> yeah, it's just not how the body works. Like <laughs> if you're, you're flexing at the elbow, yes, the bicep is going to be your most contributing, but there's going to be other muscle groups that are having to work to stabilize the upper arm and the shoulder and so on and so forth. So now you talk about Sable, which we, you and I both love to talk about yes. Sable because she's awesome. But I also wanted to circle back around with us saying that everyone can grow their glutes. And I know people see me oftentimes as a competitor or past competitor. And so they might think, okay, that's a little bit different. And he brings up Sable and that's, that's an IFBB pro. Is this going to still be stuff that applies to the everyday person, like the, the mom or the shift worker or someone who works a nine to five, or is this really just going to be for people whose whole life is training like a competitor? That is the, the funniest thing to me. And I think that it goes in part to maybe what we show on social or whatnot. Um, but I would say that a majority of the individuals that I have put these practices in place with are the individuals that you talk about. The individual who is not a competitor and fitness is not their life. They only have an hour to train four days a week. Like this program is four days a week. The sessions themselves, we have timed every <laughs> session Trust. to a T. And I have been 
a stickler about this. <laughs> and I think the longest session was like an hour and five minutes. Yeah. And we, uh, we trialed different things. We tested different things to make sure that it was in that hour marker, because I know how important that is for so many individuals to be able to get in and get out in that time frame. Um, and some are even shorter than that, especially as you get towards the end of the, f uh, training phase, which, you know, we'll talk about that when, <laughs> when the time comes. Um, but nevertheless, the moms, the shift workers, the person who works the nine to five can most definitely see this progress and feel so much better. The, the beautiful thing within our work is the opportunity to see self-confidence be blossomed from nothing and to provide that for them through the confidence of getting stronger in the gym or how they look or how they feel in their body is something that I could never repay. And to make that impact, and, and especially within glute training, because it's a such a common goal within our clientele, I, I associate the two uh, together often because it is something where they've tried everything mm -hmm. and are so frustrated that they look in the mirror and they're like, still nothing. And then after our time working together, they finally have achieved the goal that they've set out to do for so long um, and that they've longed for and feel like they're not even capable of doing. That's the coolest thing for me. I agree. And just like multiple clients came to mind of ones that had gone through multiple other coaching services and were even hesitant to sign up for another one because they didn't want to be disappointed again and then seeing results they've never seen. And I've had such a great pleasure of having a front row view to so many of your clients' transformations. Because while you have insane transformations for people that are competitors or they are coaches and fitness is more a part of their life, some of the most insane transformations that you've shared with me and publicly are ones of people who are working multiple jobs, who have insane lives. They're maybe working moms or something going on. They're moving multiple times and they still get the results. And that's something that, like you said, it's so rewarding. It's so fulfilling. And it does crack me up where people think, oh, that's going to be just for competitors. And it's like, no, it's going to be for you. Mm -hmm. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Going back to the intensity, I know that I had gotten a question of if you can grow your glutes without using weights. No, I don't think that that's going to be possible. With growing your glutes, you're going to have to force adaptation to transpire. And what that adaptation is going to be is that you're utilizing, to make this as simple as possible, you are squatting 100 pounds, and then you're going to, over time, be able to perform that same repetition allotment and be able to squat 125 pounds. And then you're going to continue to progress and get to 150. And without weights, you're going to be able to make some progress, um, not necessarily from a muscle density standpoint, maybe from a muscular endurance perspective. And you may see that your body composition is improving. And so you may feel as though that your glutes are growing, but in all actuality, you're losing body fat and you're seeing more of your glute um, or your leg as a whole having a little bit more definition. And so that appears to you as more muscular strength. But in all actuality, it could just be that you're also getting more muscle glycogen to the, to the muscle itself that you were maybe not training well before or whatever the case may be. And so although it may look visually as you know, to a beginner or someone who's lost a considerable amount of weight, that without weights, their legs look better. Growing muscle density is not going to transpire without any resistance training or weight being lifted. I think that people often 
underestimate how much they have to lift to truly see that change. And I think the word progressive overload is thrown around a lot. And people just think that means like lifting as much as you can. Or I mean, a a lot of people think just trying to lift more and more over time. And that really is the gist of it because your body does adapt. And so you need to put more stress on it to allow it to be able to make a change. And so people think like, oh, I'm lifting heavy or it's hard right now. But just because something is hard doesn't mean that you're taking it to that higher intensity or doesn't mean that you're not capable of doing more. And we actually just recorded a video and I will make sure it's in the show notes or description box about when it's going live or if it has gone live that the link is there, but all about picking that load selection when you're in the gym, because that's going to be a big part of your intensity is of course the execution, but then that load selection that you are really challenging yourself with and being able to see that intensity and then that density come next. Right. And and a lot of our clients come to us not really knowing, should they go up in weight or should they not? Like, should they, should they use the same weight from the first set to the fourth set or first set to the third set, whatever the case may be. Um, And so teaching on that, and I think that video is going to help tremendously with that of just hearing more of your thoughts as you go through the training. Um, But I think that that's another thing that people run into because they don't know what hard actually feels like. They're like, well, I, I felt like I felt burn in my shoulders. So I stopped. It's like, well, yeah, the burn is, you know, part of this, but you could have done, you know, another five or six reps. And so getting to a place where you are actually getting to that failure. And this is something that we do within our coaching where, when we start with someone, we get them into a controlled environment. An easy one, in my opinion, is like a a leg extension. I think a leg extension is a really easy one to get to failure um, and not be you know a possibility of an injury, provided that the person's not being you know crazy within their execution. Right? Like you can get hurt any situation, yeah. <laughs> but that one's pretty controlled. And so taking it to failure of like, okay, pick a weight that you would normally do for ten, and I just want you to go until you physically can't, and often. Oftentimes when that person's going through that, they may get 12, 15, 18. I've seen 20 plus before. Mm -hmm. And it is like this light bulb shift. And I have videos of individuals doing this and you see it in their eyes of like, oh my gosh, I'm still going. I can't believe I'm so much stronger. And that is a, a really cool moment because you're already breaking down these mental barriers that they've placed on themselves before you even start working with them in this one situation. Now, would I have someone do this in a back squat? No, <laughs> no, no. I would not do that in a back squat. <laughs> um, I would not do it in an RDL. Anything that's going to be free weight and uh, force them to a place where they have to pitch the weight in any situation. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm talking about. But a machine where they can easily, like as soon as they're no longer able to lift it, it's, d- it's down yeah. and they're not in a unsafe position. That's where we would test this out. And so I, I think that getting a baseline understanding of what failure really is, is tremendously important. You've helped me a ton with that because even today, as I was going through the session, the first, the first set was difficult and it was in my notes to keep going up from the last week. And I made a comment of like, man, last week me thought I could do a lot more than I think that I can do right now. And I did what I wrote down that I thought that I could do. And it was freaking hard. And there were times where like, I'm trying to get to 12 reps. And at the eighth rep, I'm like, I don't think I can go any longer. And it's like, nope, take a breath and keep going because we're getting to 12. And I surprised myself in so many exercises today, even to this day of this is nine, 10 years down the road of me training of still surprising myself because there's so much in between our freaking ears that stops us. And when I'm with people in the gym, they say something like, oh, I can't lift that or that's too heavy for me. I always have like your voice in my head because there's so many times where I think about doing a less weight or I think about just keeping it the same. And I'm like, no, Alex would say that I could do more. And it's just basically channeling like your belief in me and to myself of like, Alex would say I could do more, so I can probably do more. And I'll grip it and rip it, get it done. And it's like, oh, I could do more. And I actually was holding myself back by not even trying to do more. I mean, you miss 100 
percent of the shots you don't take, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott, <laughs> Sue Gaines. <laughs> this was this was instilled in me, um, and I'm going to put something out into the universe that I've been trying to put out in the universe for a long time. This was instilled in me from. Uh, the individual who introduced me to lifting and in Josh Wildeman, where he was my strength conditioning coach. Love you, Josh. <laughs> yeah. um, he was my strength conditioning coach as I entered high school. And then I was very fortunate as I um, left high school and got into college that he ended up moving to the university that I was at and uh, teaching uh, at that university and being the strength conditioning coach, I was able to intern under him. And um, it has been a, a long-term goal for me uh, to have him be in some way a, f a part of the physique development staff. And uh, if individuals who are listening and you guys are, are fans of the physique development training club app, and you have uh, wanted to have more of an athletic based program design for you, or, um, you know, I know that guys for, for me and friends are golfing now as adults and want to be better with their golf game. We could have programming for that. So if you guys want things of that nature, um, let us know wherever you can. <laughs> yeah. DM us, comment on this, shoot us an email, like literally any way you want to get a hold of us, I'll yeah. put it all below. Because <laughs> if you guys can create more <laughs> hype around it, then I will make it happen even faster type <laughs> situation. Um, but he was a massive stickler for execution of exercise and safety of exercise, of course, but also for the intensity. And and once you were able to um, master the, the form of these exercises, he was huge on just pushing you to the max with these exercises. And I have carried that with me from, you know, that's, it's been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, you know, 15, 16 years, uh, maybe longer than that since I, I met him and um, I still carry that with me every day. And I'm, I know how lucky I am to have someone who instilled that in, in me from the first day I entered a gym. And I know how many people would be so grateful to have that opportunity. And so I, I have such a level of gratitude for him for that amongst many other things and him being an amazing human and I can go on and on, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's very important. Yes, and Josh is absolutely awesome. awesome. Yeah. Uh, with that, it's something where we've had a few clients in town and been able to train with them. And there's so many times that you'll be like, if I could just train one or two sessions with this client, it would all make sense. And it's been so great to be able to have some of those clients in town and be able to even within the coaches of training with them and just being able to help level that up. Because if you're not around that environment, then you you don't know, you haven't been pushed that way. And for myself, I had lifted in sports that I had done, but I was never pushed at all, not once. And so then when I got into lifting, I was thankfully around a lot of men at that time, just because the whole gym at my college was dominated by males. And so I was pushed a little bit in that regard, and I wanted to be strong. And since I was one of the only only girls there. I like wanted to show out. But when I met you was really when it was like enforced in me of like you try and you push yourself and you actually train. You don't just go and have a workout. You go, you put your head down and you train. And it has yielded so many results for me, which I'll always be thankful for. But then also so much mental strength as well of just it's just you have to do the thing and you recognize that you can do the thing and then you keep doing things that you don't think you can do and figuring out if you can or you can't. I am uh, someone who has a lot of self-belief. I've always carried that and, and I have been fortunate in my own thinking, I suppose, that if one person, I can see one person do something, then I believe in myself enough that I can also do the thing. Um, and I actually was going to make a, a post about this the other day because Sam, uh, gosh, Miguel would know his last name. Um, he, Sam is a friend of ours from social media and I screw up his last name all the time. It starts with a K and he has ran a marathon recently. He's about to get into a, a natural bodybuilding competition and compete at a very high level. He's done all these things. And I've had a lot of 
people since I started running asking me about, am I worried about losing leg size? And I'm like, have you guys seen Sam? <laughs> like Sam just ran a, a marathon. And I think in three weeks is competing at worlds for natural bodybuilding and looks amazing. That man did not lose any quad density whatsoever. And if Sam can do it, I believe in myself enough <laughs> that I can also do it. And it may take me longer. It may take me, you know, I, I may have to have some pit stops and those different things. And it will look different than how Sam got there, but I believe because Sam's done it, that I can also do it. Yeah. And I carry that, like, there's so many things in my life that it's just like one person showed me, then it's like, okay, well then I can do it. I just have to find my way to do it. And, um, I would love, and, and I love to be able to instill that in my clients as well. That's mm -hmm. like one of the things that I very much so enjoy to have the opportunity to see that change in their mentality of like, well, they did it, but like, I can't do that. It's like, no, no, no. You should look at it as if because they did it, you can also do it, um, which is a really cool feeling. Yeah. I, that's so much of what I have accomplished in my life is literally just seeing one snippet of it being possible and chasing after what I want my version to look like. And I, I'm sure that I can find either footage or somewhere written, and I know I thought it, that I would never have glutes. And then really realizing now I have glutes that people think are fake. <laughs> I can made it. So like it, it just is so much of believing you can do it and having this not even false belief, but just like an unending belief in yourself can help you in every aspect in life. And I know you and I are both very passionate about that. But you mentioned about nutrition playing a big role here and the concept of not eating enough or possibly overtraining. So how is someone supposed to know if they are eating enough to grow their glutes? Eating enough. So this is a, a challenging one, and this is going to come with uh, trial and error. This is where nutrition is an ever evolving situation because your expenditure on a day to day basis, unless you're tracking a lot of variables, is going to have fluctuations depending on what you have going on and those different factors. And so, what I would encourage is starting with a, an intake of either you're working with a coach and they're obviously handing that nutrition. That would be best case scenario or you use a free nutrition calculator. Now, we have had episodes on this. We have our own uh, nutrition calculator. If you'd like to utilize it, I'm sure it'll be in the show notes or in the comments below. Um, use that as a reference point. Is this gonna be perfect? Is this going to be the intake for you for eternity? Probably not, but it's at least going to get you started. And then you're going to be able to track for, let's say two weeks. You'll track for two weeks and just understand how you feel. Do you feel like, do you feel that your digestion's in a good place? Do you feel like you have adequate appetite? Do you feel that you are constantly stuffed full? Like what are we running into? Or do we feel good? Do we feel better? Do we feel more energetic? Um, these would be important things. And when you're using that nutrition calculator, you're going to want to probably put in um, like maintenance. I wouldn't jump to a surplus. I wouldn't jump to a deficit. Just put in that you're wanting to maintain and then kind of getting a, a good base there. Once you have that foundation of nutrition in place, then as you start to train, how are we feeling following these training sessions? Are we seeing that we are having excess soreness? You have glutes on Monday and then you have your second glute session on Thursday. By the time that you get to that second glute session, are you still screaming? Like, is, are your legs still extremely tired um, and, and sore from Monday session? Well, we may need to either increase food. You may be having too much uh, training volume or training intensity that may need to be evaluated. You may need to do better with your reco recovery, where your sleep is, where your day-to-day -day movement is at. There's a lot of different factors that we would need to assess if you're eating enough or not enough. Okay. So like, what's that exact calorie amount for me? <laughs> Trial and error. Oh, so you're not going to just give me the no. answer. That's the perfect amount to eat, to grow my glutes and also like keep a thin waist and <laughs> everything else. I'm not. And That's really the, the one thing to really drive home with it, if we were to say like one macronutrient in this setting is the most important is that you being very consistent with your protein consumption and then having those feedings throughout the day, not just having, I'm having 60 or 60 grams for breakfast and I'm having 60 grams for dinner. Like <laughs> that would not be fun, but people do it. Yeah. And so if we can spread it out, if we can have four feedings throughout the day that we have at least 25 to 30 grams of protein, 
is going to be a really good start. It's not even that you have to track your calories fully, but that's a good place to start of consistently getting protein into your diet um, and having mo muscle protein synthesis occur and these different factors. And so protein is going to be of abundance uh, importance. And then your total calorie allotment is going to be kind of the next important thing. The carbohydrates and the total fats, if we're looking at training performance and growing your glutes, carbs are probably going to be a great resource there more than fats. But at the same time, if you're able to hit your protein on a day-to-day -day basis and hit a calorie goal, and then continue to train hard, you're probably going to see the results that you want to see. If you want to be the most optimal and as close to perfect as you possibly could be, probably having the greater density of protein, a greater density of carbohydrates, and more moderate fats, probably the best for your overall training performance. Are you not going to see growth if you don't do exactly the most optimal thing I just said? No, <laughs> you can do the other option as well, but if you want to try and squeeze out every inch of possible growth that you can get, you can get more and more optimal, you can get more and more nuanced, but at that same token, you can go the opposite direction by getting too nuanced and too trying to be too optimal because you're putting too many variables in place. So there's a common ground that you're trying to find, and the thing within your fitness journey that you're going to have to understand is that it is all trial and error. The entire time, it is trial and error. You're collecting data, you're making changes off of that data, and then you go again and you collect more data, and it just continues to rinse and repeat, and you learn more about yourself throughout the entire journey, and as the years accumulate, you're just going to get really, really crisp in understanding how your body functions because you've worked so hard to better understand it by looking at all these different variables. And so it's not just one calorie allotment of take your body weight times this, and then all of a sudden your glutes are gonna grow. There's a lot of things. <laughs> Well, I know that you are quite passionate about that overall, and I am too within the concept of trial and error. And even if you have a coach, there's still going to be trial and error because you have to learn about yourself to be able to see what needs to be changed for your circumstances and you personally, because you know we're all unique and different. Uh, but I think that for myself, if I'm going to speak on like this program in and of itself and not just glute growth in general... You can see glute growth when you're not at maintenance or a surplus. Uh, that can happen with newbie gains or it can happen with body composition and some other factors in place there. It's not always the most ideal and you're not going to always see the most growth possible, but it can happen. I do want to mention that. But why Alex said that you should definitely eat at maintenance starting off, especially if you haven't been tracking, is that this training is very hard. And since there is that intensity and as long as you are training with the right RPE. I think that I had said to you a few weeks into the programming, the thing that I would tell anyone is that you got to train hard and you got to eat well. But if you don't train hard, then you're not going to see the glute growth that you want and you'll probably see more fat accumulation than you want. So if you don't train hard, well, but you're still eating hard. It, yeah. If you're eating hard, yeah, yes. I want to make that abundantly <laughs> yeah. clear. So then if you are in a place where you're training hard, but you're not eating enough, then you're not recovering. So then you're not able to see the growth that you want to be able to see and you're kind of spinning your wheels or digging yourself into a hole. And so it's extremely important to have the two together so that you can see the glute growth and still feel okay throughout the whole process. So I think that really, like if you have the intensity, it's not that, oh, because I'm eating at maintenance or a slight surplus that I'm going to see all this fat gain. Because again, that intensity and in building muscle is going to help with that aspect of not having as much of a fat gain. There's still going to be some there, but not as much. Well, I'd also say that oftentimes when people say they're going into a surplus, they just think that <laughs> yes. I'm going to keep adding more food because I'm in a surplus. Yes. It's like, well, at some point, this is going to just be added body fat that you're going to need to pull off at some point. And so I'm a really big proponent of just a pretty minimal surplus, enough to where we can see recovery within training and we're seeing progress within training. And if the the volume of training is going to go up, then we're going to also match that with food um, and those different factors. I, I used to, and I think that this was also kind of the culture, I guess, five, six years ago, where it was like, 
it was marketing for you to have clients who said they were eating five and 600 grams of carbs every day. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's kind of died off or it's just not my audience anymore. (laughs) It's one or the other. Um, but it, at that time, I was just trying to push food as high as possible so that, you know, we could eat as much as possible. But then I was finding myself in the situation where it's like, we just added more body fat that wasn't necessary to be added. And then we have to work so hard to pull it back off um, whenever the time came that we wanted to diet or what have you. And so being in more of a moderate surplus, even just a small surplus has been much more ideal uh, for my clients, especially in the lifestyle setting, because in the lifestyle setting, there's not any inherent rush for us to add muscle tissue. And there's not going to be a huge benefit to eating in such excess that you're going to add more muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And from a lifestyle perspective, I would imagine that most individuals think that the holy grail, as well as myself, would be like a body recomp situation where you're able to add muscle tissue and see fat loss simultaneously. That's the the holy grail. Now, how often can you do that? Very infrequently in the grand scheme of things, but it can happen for some individuals. And um, by having this approach of more of a moderate to small surplus, where we're just focusing on the recovery from training and overall training performance, we're able to um, have a much easier time to diet whenever that time comes because the, the transition isn't as as large as a person who's had this huge surplus and then we've got to make our way back to even getting to maintenance and then we start to get into the deficit itself. Whereas if we have this small surplus, it's a much easier time for us to get back to maintenance and then we get right into the deficit. And so those first few weeks of a dieting phase are much more productive than the person who has this 30% um, surplus in place. And, you know, we've got to spend four weeks just getting down from that back to maintenance. So if you are a a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled. And I look forward to speaking with you. You did talk about some ways that people can track their glute growth or even just track where their food's at of kind of putting something in place, doing the trial and error and being able to take inventory of how they feel. But when it comes to tracking glute growth overall, what are ways to track that glute growth? I'm huge on photos. So having consistent photos in the same location with similar clothing, with similar lighting, um, and being able to see from below your feet to above your head and and having photos that are facing forward uh, from the side profile, from the back, and being able to compare those over time. Best, one of the best resources. The second, which is kind of like a 1A and 1B, would be actual measurements. The measurements are gonna tell you a a big story there. Now, the one thing with measurements and, and something that I see with clients is that if we're taking measurements week to week, it gets a little bit cumbersome because from week to week, you may see like an eighth of an inch change. But if we're looking at it from a month to month standpoint and having them every four weeks within the check-in, I find that to be much more helpful because we do see greater progress in those measurements from a month to month basis relative to week to week where with physique photos, we can see changes week to week. Um, with, you know, difference in, in training volume or recovery or how that person's feeling, we can identify small things to highlight and say, okay, we're seeing progress in this area. So physique photos, measurements, um, I would say, I guess, you know, scale readings to a degree, I wouldn't get too hung up on like, okay, I put on a pound this week on the scale. And that means that I added a pound of muscle tissue to my glutes. Like that's not going to be a direct, uh, reflection. Um, but the scale readings are going to kind of be in tandem with those other factors. Yeah. I I think that pictures just reign supreme so much. And especially for someone who has a trained eye like you of, you really can see those differences on week to week of what's going on. And you point those out in check-ins of, I can see the inflammation, or this is because the training did this and be able to point those out, which is helpful for someone else to kind of see what you're seeing, uh, as you're going through it. Yeah. And, you know, taking pictures of yourself in normal clothes, because at the end of the day, most individuals (laughs) just want to look and feel great in their normal clothes. And so if you're comparing photos in those normal clothes from a month to month or bi-monthly, and you're like, oh man, I, my glutes look a lot better in these leggings. It's like, Awesome. Yeah. Does it matter what the measurement is? Does it matter what you weigh? You visually see that you look a lot better in those in those pants 
Mm-hmm. Nothing else matters. Mm-hmm. That was your goal. So be like, be happy with that. And it doesn't mean that like, if the scale doesn't go down, that, you know, that is not important anymore. And the scale is more important. It's like your whole goal was to feel great and look great in your clothes and you've done that. And so the scale shouldn't matter at that point, but that's off on a, another topic. I'm right there with you. I mean, I've seen a lot of people have like a goal weight and that really end up ruining what their progress is because they're so honed in on that scale reading and not looking at what was the overall goal or what was the intention of what I looked like, where I used to have, oh, I I really want to weigh 120, where now I sit around 135 and I, I love the way that I look. And it's just that I thought, oh, I needed to be this weight. And if I held myself to that, I wouldn't have seen everything that's on the other side of it. When it does come to training glutes, can you train your glutes every day? This is a good question. And I think that every day needs to be better defined. Like, are we saying every day as in seven days a week? I would say no. If if you're going to try and train glutes every single day of the week, then that's not going to be the case. Are you training glutes three days a week? Like you have a a training program that you're working out three days a week, could you train glutes on all three of those days? Yes, you could figure that out and be able to have the appropriate training volume as well as the exercise selection to match the ability to train in that fashion. Could you train glutes four days a week? You could. It's not going to be something that you could sustain probably. You could do it in in specific scenarios for short periods of time with really particular exercise selection, with really particular volume and intensity that you're achieving. So you could do that. Could you do it five days a week? I'm going to put that in the category of no. (laughs) So could you do it in a three or four day training phase with very strategic and well-programmed exercise selection and so on? Yes, I, I do think that you could do that. Three is probably the most feasible, though. If you were to you know, be doing it on your own and, and trying to figure it out, uh, you would probably be able to figure out how to train glutes three days a week and be able to recover. So if someone were to train glutes two times a week, so let's say they have a four-day training phase, two upper, two lower, is two times a week enough then? Oh, absolutely. Um, I would say that two is kind of that that sweet spot. Um, I would say that one session a week is going to be a little bit of a challenge to get enough training volume in. And the reason I say that is that you're going to have fatigue in the session that's going to accumulate, right? So we have exercises that we're performing that are going to be more fatiguing than others. Um, And if we were to try and get all of our, and we have the goal of growing our glutes is the number one thing we're trying to do. And so we're biasing all of our, uh, our good portion of our training volume towards glutes. If you're doing that all in one session, the first maybe one or two exercises may go well for you. The third exercise may go well for you. And then as we start to get into four or five or even six exercises for glutes in one session, I can't imagine doing it, but (laughs) if you were to do it, you may find yourself in a place where you're still doing exercise four, five, and six, but the strength that you have for that session or for those exercises is nothing of what the first three exercises were. Your stability for those last three exercises are nothing like what you had for the three exercises before. And your overall fatigue set in is going to be very high. And so your ability to focus is going to be low. Mm -hmm. And so the likelihood that you're getting what you need to get out of those three exercises for you to really track and say, this volume from the first three exercises has the same value as the volume from these three exercises does not make sense. And so if we were to take, let's say you do the three exercises and then you move the other three exercises to two or three days later, you would be able to see, oh my gosh, I have so much more strength in these exercises than what I thought I did when I had them all in the same session. And so by doing them in two, in, you know, splitting them in two sessions, I think is the best situation for people. And you've got to get, if you're trying to go to three sessions a week, it's one of those things that you have to be very strategic within the exercise selection, the intensity that is met, how many nutrients are in place, those different factors um, to ensure that recovery is, is optimal. And you're not just throwing more volume at a muscle group that doesn't inherently need it. Because if, if you're going, if you're trying to train glutes three times a week, and you're you know training five days a week in total, and two of those are full upper sessions, and then the other three sessions are pretty glute dominant. And you're just going from session one to session three to session five within those glute training uh, sessions, and sore, sore, 
sore, more sore, and just continuing to build up that fatigue and not have any true recovery, you're not actually seeing growth. You're just beating up that tissue um, and not having the time to actually see the growth and the the improvement. So um, I think that answers your question. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to soreness, should I not see soreness or should I see soreness? You're going to see soreness. Like soreness is going to be part of the, the training, especially if you are getting into new exercises. Let's say that you're doing different exercises than you've done before. That is going to be a new stimulus to the muscle and your body. And so you're going to see greater soreness there. As you progress through a training phase, and this is why individuals who are just going through swipe workouts and doing different things every session because they see their favorite influencer are just chronically sore and not seeing any real progress because they are not allowing for themselves to build adaptations and improve the movement pattern of what those exercises are or get better at particular rep ranges or whatever the case may be. And so you're going to have some soreness and then you're also going to experience some soreness in, in which you go up and wait. You you go up and wait in a handful of exercises for that session, you're going to have some soreness from that. But if you are debilitatingly sore week after week after week for a month or two on end, you're probably in a situation where you need to reevaluate what is going on within your training, whether that be your nutrition or your recovery or the training volume or the exercise selection. These things need to be evaluated to put you in a better spot so that you're actually seeing that progress. Because if you are showing up sore every single session, you're probably not going up in weight during those sessions either. And um, you're probably having poor sleep. You're, you're seeing you know more breakouts and those different things. And so your body's in a very stressed state. And the best thing for you is to probably take some days away from training and rest and then get back to training after you reevaluate why you were so beat up you know, previously. So I, sometimes it's hard, even like you and I get into positions where we realize we're a little bit beat up and we have to take an extra rest day. And it might be that our training volume and everything chef's kiss, but maybe I just don't get very good sleep. Maybe I under ate, maybe just other things were happening in life so that there's more stress happening. And so the ability to regulate that and really reflect on what's going on, I think is so powerful instead of just thinking, oh, I should be sore. Soreness is an indicator that I'm doing a good job job. And it's like, like you said, it's going to be there, but it doesn't need to be debilitating and take up everything, be sore to the touch. You're going into your next session with that muscle group and you're like, how am I even going to do this? That shouldn't be at play on a day to day. So when it comes to how much time you should give yourself to grow your glutes, what does that look like? This is going to vary from person to person because depending on where you're starting at is going to, you know, be very dependent on that because let's say that you are very new to the exercises that are going to be of tremendous benefit for you to grow your glutes. It may take you a little bit of a buffer period to figure out how to perform those well, what weight you can do, um, and those different things. So that could be a couple of weeks on the front end that would need time for you to be able to, okay, now I've got my ducks in a row and I can actually train hard. Um, but let's say that you have the individual who is um, adapted to the exercises and understands them, has great movement patterns is, is, and is ready to go. I think that a lot can happen in 90 days. I think that you give yourself 12 weeks, you're going to see some good growth and and noticeable growth in that time frame. You give yourself six months, you're going to see even more. And, and throughout this entire time, you're doing a great job within managing your digestion and nourishing your body and resting and doing the things that are going to help you see that growth because growth is a is a, a a long game. You're not playing just the eight weeks, even you know ten weeks. I just said ninety days, but you're going to see you know progress in that time frame. But the more time that you can sustain adequate nutrient intake and continue to train hard, the better results that you're going to mm -hmm. see. That's the you know I, if we wanted to say what's the what's the perfect amount of time? Five years. Yeah. <laughs> like spend five years in a maintenance or a surplus and be super duper diligent within your training and your nutrition and all these different things, um, you're gonna see the best results ever. But are you willing to put in the five years, you know? And so oftentimes individuals are, are not able to stick to something for more than like three or four weeks. And so if you're able to stick to a program for 90 days and really nourish your body over that time frame, 
you're going to see great results, but it's only going to get better if you continue to have that adherence for six months, nine months, a year. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people might have been surprised by my progress pictures of, okay, she's been training for a long time. How is she able to get those results? And I think that, again, being able to look at context of where someone's starting of, yes, I have trained for a long time, but I also was coming out of a diet. So coming out of a diet, I'm in a primed place to grow muscle and to be able to see that change of some of it being glycogen, a good chunk of it being muscle and some of it being fat. So that, as well as we really increased the intensity, I locked down on a training goal and we went after it. And so you can see this, even if you have been training for a while, you can see these results. It just depends on, again, where are you starting from? What is the circumstance surrounding it? And then just being able to get after it because consistency is such a huge one. And I think people get so annoyed from hearing it, but people ask, should I do this? Should I do this? Should I do this? And it's like, are you consistently getting your water in in a day? Are you consistently getting your steps in? And people want to brush that off. But that's so much the reason I always go back to it and that we always go back to it is it does make a difference. It does matter if those things are being done or not, because that affects everything else that can explain a lot of the other things going on. So that consistency is so, so important. Um, and I'm glad that there is so much hype around the program, because then I think people are just going to be so excited to see what does happen when I really dedicate 12 or 16 weeks to this and I go all in on betting on myself. Right. I'm very excited as well. Good deal. Well, those were all of the cues for our Q&A. Do you have anything else to say? No, I think these were awesome questions. I think that these were very, very helpful um, for people to understand more about glute training as a whole. And um, as we've talked about, you know, thoroughly throughout this, this <laughs> glute training program is is absolutely awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for listening and or watching. If you have a friend who has small glutes, don't gatekeep. Share this episode with them and we'll catch you in the next one.